Well, I've seen Mad River since 1949. 1984. 1978. I started skiing here when I was three years old. I was three years old when we first started. There's something about this place that just holds you. The vibe here spoke to me. I started probably skiing here in 68. 1997. 1989. This place is, is magic. I'm so in awe of this place. Since my birth. This was my place. This was my mountain. This place just has a heartbeat. It really is a magic. The camaraderie and the love that everybody has here just permeates. And we have to take that love and spread it. I love this place so much. I really think the patrol for a, a, a very long time, it's been really the heart of Mad River. Life as a patrol is really, really, really good here. My 27th season here at Mad River. You know, we ask all patrollers to be at the top of the mountain by last chair. That's probably the nicest time of day. Oh, there's nothing like getting to the top of paradise for trail check. We leave from the top of the mountain, sweep the mountain, both peaks around the same time. And by the time we get down, we know that nobody's left on the mountain. Everybody's down safely. I believe a patrol started out from a totally volunteer basis, except for the patrol director. All that has changed over the years, but we have five to eight paid patrollers to uh, fill the void. I was in my 80s. We took it down from the top of paradise, and I was the tail man, and so I wasn't on the front. Our assistant director said when we got to the bottom, it's a good thing the patient doesn't know how old you are. <laughs> Some of the hardest things on patrol here I think it's kind of the uncertainty of the season and that we rely on the natural snow and for lining up a job or your duties, you just you never know when it's going to start, begin, how long it's going to end. There's all sorts of experience on board, you know. There's, we have doctors and lawyers and engineers, they're all here to help people. As far as the tradition of it, Howard Martin, he's kind of the patriarch of the whole thing. I got my national in 52. We only had three trails in three quick trips. I could pretty much know the condition of the trails. I'd know if I had an accident, where I was going to run the toboggan and how I was going to run it. Ski racer usually looks his course over, knows what he's going to do. And that's no different than what I'm talking about. I just knew what I was going to do before it happened. I think we all aspire to be Howard. The clubs were a big part of Mad River Glen's history and legacy. These clubs serve a purpose of continuity. I think that they solidified the, that base and core of the mountain. We belong to the Hartford Ski Club. You've got Ramapo, Montclair, Hartford, uh, White Plains. It was a constant party and such, again, a community. At the Hartford Club, you cooked together, you ate together, you skied together. They play a big role in this mountain. That's another reason we see so many multi-generational families up here. Mad River is my home. I love this place. This is the place to call home. It's home for so many people. My mom started working here first. My dad was a bar attendant. We had free tickets to ski, so it was really a no-brainer. Come play at Mad River. I mean, it's been an awesome place to continue to grow up. It shaped me as a person and as a skier. Mad River Glen feels like my home. The best way to describe it, like home. This is the first alpine ski area in the country that had telemark rentals and lessons. Betsy loved the idea of telemark skiing. I think what she saw was Roland Palmetto putting skins on and going up here before the lifts and trails were cut. That spirit she got. And no wonder telemarkers liked it so much here. Because it was untouched, it was real snow, it was real terrain. It still remains today. The first competition I ever did on skis was the Mad River Glen Telefest. The Mad River Glen NATO Telemark Festival it was like a potlatch, a great big party. We had Europeans coming too for those festivals at the time. Ski riders were groping for things to write about back in the 80s. The hot dog was done, and we just happened to be the Telemark thing, and that brought all this attention to Mad River and our festivals. I'm a Telemark skier. The freedom of telemark skiing I describe as dancing on skis. But the lift service serves me really well when I can get out for a couple of hours and get my laps in and call it a day of skiing. Um, but I love getting out in nature and being away from, from the crowds uh, as well. 
The Telemark is really just the downhill part of backcountry skiing. You can ski anywhere in Vermont. Before Nordic Alpine Telemark, there was just backcountry skiing. The universe changes for the Telemark skiers when they realize that skiing happens in all directions. Working with Betsy closely for the last seven years that she on the mountain, I had a great unique position to watch the transition from Betsy owning it, the Mad River Corp, to the co-op. I'm one of four people who started the co-op back in 1995. John Olson is referred to as the father of Mad River. I'm the, the midwife. There's something about this mountain. People gotta realize Betsy herself owned the dirt. She owned the dirt, everything. All other skiers were behooved to boards, forest service, national and state forest service, corporate entities. She owned the dirt. She was a very loyal to Mad River and lost, I'm guessing now, $3 million in keeping the mountain alive. Her philosophy was that skiing should be affordable and should be affordable to everybody. Betsy was visionary that she came up with this vehicle to, to sell the mountain to the skiers. It was really a remarkable thing and she wanted it to be the locals place. Keep in mind that at that, in that period of time was the beginning of the corporatization of skiing, and that was when the American Ski Company owned Sugarbush at the time. And when she first was promoting the plan, uh, the number of people who enthusiastically jumped on board was zero. I saw the resistance to what she was doing. It took years, yeah, it literally, the, the seven years that I worked for her. When Les Otten owned Sugarbush, and wanted to buy this. She would say things like, I will close it before I'll sell it to you. It was never about the money with Betsy. Um, she used to run the Mad River Barn and she did a lot of the things like the linens. And while we were speaking, the FedEx driver came up and gave Betsy an envelope. She opened it up, looked at it real quickly and handed it to me and said, I get these all the time. And I looked at it and it was an offer for $3 million by some group to buy the mountain. She ended up selling it for $2.5 million to the co-op. We closed with 1,000 shares sold. 1,008 to be exact. And we had to get to 1667 to pay off Betsy. And uh, Betsy gave us an interest-free loan to get us there so that we had operating capital. It was a five-year interest-free note, and I believe we sold the 1667th share in the third season of the co-op. The original mission of Mad River Glen Co-op was to preserve and protect the forest and mountain ecosystem for skiing and other recreational access. That was the direction, that was the vision. 25 years ago, I bought a share with two other friends of mine that are one, both ski patrols at the time, Sean Lawson and Christian Jakewith. The three of us, on a very limited budget, could band together. We signed up for the 50 bucks a month program, split it three ways. With the idea that we'd have to reach out to each other to come up with our $200 APR. There's no reaching out, we're all still here. Everything that you see in place today is all because of Betsy's plan. And I'm so appreciative of the people that came together to buy this place. 2,000 owners and a nine person board, which is certainly interesting to work for. Not a corporation, it's a cooperative. It's our mountain. Hats off to Betsy. The whole idea of the co-op was to protect and preserve forever. Think longer term. Yeah, the kids ski free, that was a brilliant strategic marketing move. The idea was to offer free season passes to kids 12 and under to encourage people to buy passes because you can get your free kids passes unless the adults had a pass. That's hard to understate how important that is to where we are today. I, I credit the 12 and under program with being one of the most significant decisions that the co-op ever made. And it had the longest lasting impact for the long-term viability of the co-op. The best memory is meeting my wife here. Families are started here. We raised our family here. This is a great place for my family. That's what got me here, family. This place raised our kids. 
I hear a lot of families saying, we'll see you in the base area. The trails naturally all come down to one place, one base area. So kids get a lot of freedom because everybody knows where they're gonna end up. My parents definitely believed in just kind of letting us go. It's a playground unlike any other for kids. The fact that everyone can just funnel back to the base area and right. wait up on the deck for your family or friends to, to reunite. So much safer here than at any other ski area. I am the mother hen of Mad River. I've always tried to have the cricket club not feel like daycare, feel like a home environment. The kids loved going to Cali's. It was like a little nest for all the kids to go. Yeah, the lunch at the cricket club was always tomato soup, grilled cheese, or mac and cheese. And to this day, those are still my comfort foods. Callie's Corner, the little pony toe, was named after me, which was a, a great honor. Terry Barber brought the ski school up to the next level from where it was, and he said, this place is special because of the magic here. This is my 48th year here at Mad River as a ski instructor. Started here when uh, Dixie Noah was the ski school director. I tell my staff, if you've been an instructor here for 20 years, you're kind of like a second semester sophomore. And for me to pass on my passion, I mean, that's important, my love for skiing. The magic that everybody else feels that's a skier here is in the ski school, too. It's a really special place. Everybody loves doing what they're doing. It's just a great family. Everybody feels the magic and the vibe as soon as they're here. It's ski instructor heaven, really, to work here. The seasonal ski school program has about 27 classes, kids from 4 to 12 of all different abilities. The kids have such a great time, and then there's a race department that's making a real resurgence. And this year, I have enough ski school experience to start in the race team. Mad River Glen had a storied racing history, from you know the Kandahar races and the, having the national championships there and college racing. I have been involved in the race team from very young age. That's where our strength is: is building the young racers and especially at Mad River, up to the U10. The ski school programs manufactured good skiers, good solid technical skiers that would go into racing. And it was just this pipeline of skiing talent. And we find at Mad River you have options. Kids can go to the free ride program. When the co-op started, they would come up with a triple crown. They come up with the all-around best skier. The triple crown. There are three different events. The unconventional, which was like skiing over a cliff and showing your best performance on skis. There was a mogul challenge, which was skiing down moguls. And then there was a vertical challenge. And it was how many runs you could do on the single in one day. The one that like I will never forget that. Um, Doug Lewis, Olympic athlete, and Tiger Baird, our classic Vermont skier guy, signed up for the event. But you have to ski shoot lift line, which is right under the lift, which is about a mile of moguls and cliffs. And those guys went toe to toe all day. And it was incredible. Yeah, that was an exciting day. And so we just go down these moguls and just hammer, hammer, hammer. He was doing tower 10 straight on the right and I was doing Tower 10 straight on the left. I didn't know who Tiger was, but everybody was talking about Tiger. And they're like, God, they're like, you're a pretty good skier. I'm like, I was in the Olympics. They're like, well, you gotta beat Tiger. I then realized that if I stay with Tiger, I'd win it because they added on the time that I started. But I'm competitive, so I passed Tiger. The next run, I crash. Yard sale, I got skis everywhere. I'm, I, claff, I crash off of the tower jumps. And now I'm 14 chairs behind Tiger again. I mean, he caught back up to me, because I was pretty well pooped at that point. It takes me two hours to catch Tiger, and then I finally pass him, and I break the record with 29 runs. We did 29, but it was really, really, really fun to, to play next to Doug. Long story short, I owned the record for a while. No, we, we don't have the fastest record. Silas Ayers does. We started the racing Triple Crown. We had Rockefeller's Challenge. And the Kandahar was a top to bottom race. And then the third leg is the family tournament, which truly encompasses all the generations of Mad River. It allows family to come together and race as a family. And it involves everyone. I started working for Terry Barber. 
as a ski school instructor with the free ski team. When I was growing up here, it was you know all racing, but I think the mountain really lends itself to free skiing and big mountain skiing. A lot of people that have come out of Mad River have gone on to skiing bigger mountains and doing some pretty crazy things. Everybody knows that this is the Ride Hawks I'd say junior match. Now Ryan was had very close ties to Mad River Glen. He was a free ride coach here. Chair 78 is dedicated to Ryan and his spirit is just all over this mountain. For some reason, this mountain just breeds free skiers. My daughter did get invited to the World Championships twice. The Lars and Silas Chickering Harris kind of got it going. Great success over the years. Uh, we've had Alonzo Darius, Turner Barber, Eli Kopstein, Natalie Slade, Sophia Bisbee, and Owen Deal. Phenomenal skiers. They were just great role models for uh, the kids. Terry Barber, who was the head of the ski school, kind of let it form organically. I met Ryan through Lars and Silas. He was very much part of the fabric of the, of the free ride community here at, uh, in Mad River. He was a very good friend, Lars Chickering Ayers, and Silas, Lars' brother. They were raised in the right place for who they've become. Lars kept my schedule. He was always there for first chair. They founded the Green Mountain Free Riders and they were very, very proud of their Vermont heritage, particularly their Mad River heritage. Lars and Silas obviously both got on to win at the world stage on the Freeride World Tour. The team was formed with you know, a handful of skiers, and now I think we've got just under 100 kids on the free ski program. This awesome network of people, and what kid wouldn't want to join the free ski team? the values of Mad River go back to the continuity of the experience here that's fostered by our relatively low uphill capacity. Oh, that old slow single. Actually, <laughs> it's the fastest fixed grip lift in North America. You get 2,000 vertical feet in nine minutes. Many other places want to make more people go up the mountain, which scrapes it off faster and increases the chances of collisions. High speed six packs, which is, you know, six people every three seconds, as opposed to one person every 10 seconds. People are intimidated to ski here. I say it's easier because you don't have to spend any time looking over your shoulder and worrying about getting run over. When you're on the trails, you know it's your trail. You come down and you're by yourself. We don't want to increase uphill capacity and we don't want to change the on-mountain experience. When I looked at this trail, like, whoa, what is this? I wasn't scared, but I'd never seen anything like it. A rite of passage for Mad River Glen kids is when the first time they get to go up the single by themselves. The single chair campaign epitomized Mad River Glen, and it solidified how people felt about the place. Independent. I mean, the single chair is sort of it encapsulates it. The skiers voted not to upgrade to a double or bigger chair. They voted to replace the single chair with a new single chair. It's symbolic of everything that the co-op and Mad River Glen represents. 80% of the shareholders voted to keep the single chair. Mad River was electing to preserve the experience that so few skiers have the opportunity to take advantage of. The Saving the Single project was, uh, a, it was a tremendous amount of work, against all odds, raising a ton of money. And we all banded together and just made this thing happen. Nobody wants change around here, so to see something Change that drastic, you know, the diesel throttle powered single chair has gone away, seeing it was from 1948 and it was time for a change. What we really had on our hands was a bona fide historic preservation project. The preservation Trust of Vermont was our essential partner. These are all new chairs, even the wheels. Everything's new except for the towers themselves. The helicopter lifted the towers. And they had a the, uh, the Vietnam vet that did the piloting. They cut the bolts. They just hooked on and flew them down to the parking lot. And then we actually helped pour some of the concrete, basically on the same ground she's always been on. We set some forward, some back, so they could get basically right where they're supposed to be. I don't think she's going to go anywhere soon. It's one of the few mile-long lifts left in existence. With the upgrade to electric power, we're now the fastest fixed grip lift in the country. And it's also one of the only lifts that goes all the way from bottom to summit. I also love the narrow trails. The trails are narrower and twistier and have so much more character than you find elsewhere. Uh, 
when I'm skiing at other ski areas in, in Vermont, it feels like you don't change the way you ski from one trail to the next. At Mad River, every single trail that you ski forces you to ski a different way. The original concept of meandering trails. The trails, the, the old-fashioned trails, narrower, steeper. There's so much sheltered snow. They get a natural experience. They get bumps made the way only skiers can make them. So it just really kind of shaped the type of skier that I am. I love moguls on the uh, chute. It, it was always the perfect trail for me. So I like creamery rock slash lower creamery rock, and I also like lee chute, which is just above it. I love Porky, the trail Porky Pine. You can go super fast on it. No one's really on it much. Just like probably every kid, my favorite trail was the rat. It's really hard to get bored here. You're not just skiing the same boulevard over and over again. Usually try to get a top to bottom run of a groomed trail. Make sure that people can get down. Most of the time, we try. I've been in some tricky situations. If you can't see the edge of the trail, then you're really hurt. From inside looking out, it's hard to see anything because the terrain so, well, there's a lot of turns and corners. It's not a straight shot. You kind of got to memorize the trails or you get lost. We don't have these edges next to the snowmaking and the guns and the chunks of hard rubble. There are so many kind of twisty, unique turns and elements to the trail that you just don't find anywhere else. The trail tells you how to ski. It just surprises us so often how, how fun and challenging and incredible the skiing is here. Stark Mountain Foundation was created in 2001 as a nonprofit organization. Here to preserve and protect the skiing and the mountain itself. Med River Co-op, because its business is to the general public, is not eligible for a 501c3 status. If Stark Mountain Foundation could do it through a nonprofit, we knew that the mountain itself and its assets had stood a good chance of outliving us. The legacy of the Stark Mountain Foundation, a tradition of valuing Stark Mountain for the great skiing in the winter, its wildlife, its environment, and support the community to protect it and preserve it. There have been people working here longer than I've been alive. And started working here out of high school. My adult life. My grandfather worked here, my dad worked here, I work here, and my daughter worked here. I started in 1998. In 2001. There has been four generations I already worked here, starting in the 40s. <laughs> a whole bunch of Irish. There's a connection with all the other employees and the skiers here and it, uh, it's palpable and it's special. It's like working with a family, and that's why I'm still here too. <laughs> it's a roller coaster ride. Keep getting on it every year. This place is, is magic. I think the place generates a legacy of family because they value the community, and I think that just makes it easy for people to find a home here. Uh, I get emotional about it. Uh, it means a lot to me for my family. Um, you know, it's home, it really is. I just love being there. So much mutual love and respect and caring. And I think that's probably one of the greatest things this mountain has to offer. So as some of the community has aged out and passed on, the younger generations have been coming up um, to fill the ranks of Mad River skiers. It's such a tight community. Everyone knows everyone, and everyone's here because they love skiing and they all have the same passion. I go back to Roland Palmeyer, who really looked at Mad River as a community of like-minded people who wanted to share this environment and who did not want to go skiing in an amusement park. This area is for skiing. Preserve Our Paradise grew into this fantastic campaign. Six years of hands-on work, 50 to 100 volunteers. The campaign raised $5.6 million and that provided money for snowmaking, renovations to the base box, a new groomer, new mowing machine, replacement of the ski school and ski patrol building. We established this relationship with Stark Mountain Foundation and they are continuing the work that we started with the capital campaign. It's a treasure, but it's one that needs to be supported. The reality of skiing in New England in the winter, there's so much suspense to a winter here. We had that ice storm back in 1998. I'd never seen anything like it. We started going up with the cats just to see what we could do, and as ugly as it was, it was beautiful. Shining everywhere. And at the time, it just seemed 
devastating to the mountain forests and everyone was surprised at how the trees recovered really amazingly from that uh, event. It's amazing how many ways you can ski this mountain and how many pathways exist for exploring and moving about the ridges and drainages and forests of this, of this landscape. I read an article in 1978 about wood skiing at Mad River Glen. At that point, it was just for a select few. It was for the Brian Holmes, and so now it's for everybody. You get a taste of powder if you're, and you're on the trail and you want more and you start looking towards the woods. While some people stay on the, on the trails, others just pop into the woods and disappear. The woods are neither open nor closed nor patrolled. It's probably the, a very organic situation around here. But it's also where the great skiing is. And so we're a skier's mountain and we've made it work. We ask people not to go in the woods after three o'clock. You know, don't go in the woods alone. You know, all that stuff still holds true. It really blew my mind when I came back here and got in the trees here. It was the steepness and the, just the way that the bumps are in the trees. There are lifetimes of options here. The nooks and crannies and, and the chimneys and the, um, the steeper, you know, alleys of Octopus's Garden and, and um, Outhouse Woods and, and the 20th and the Frontier and Curly's. I don't know that I will ever go down at being <laughs> credited with encouraging wood skiing. <laughs> I ski a lot of places and uh, this, the whole atmosphere beats them all. The uniqueness of it all draws me back. Plus the, the environment here is just, it's just a sweet spot. And the future of Matter River Land, I mean, the, the life cycle. You start here skiing in the Matter River, that passion for the place gets ingrained in you. After uh, getting out of college, and then you go out west and ski in Big Mountain and Powder. Alpha. At, at Rockwell Basin. Kirkwood. Grand Targhee. Australia. Adventuring into some really remote parts of the world. Iceland, Greenland, the Andes and Patagonia. And then you settle down in a job somewhere, find a spouse and a family, and then you bring them back to Mad River, and it starts all over. A good day at Mad River is a memory that you'll carry with you wherever you go. Mad River has this rebellious kick to it that you want to be a part of, that that's Mad River again, ski it if you can. And that keeps people coming here to say, hey, I've skied at that place. During the COVID years, we were forced to limit the number of people here based on rules coming down from the state. And what we found was that the experience can be better when we're not overrun with people. They're handling the crowd control and I'm glad that they have a little bit more snowmaking capacity and I think Mad River is thinking well about the future. And people are figuring out that wow, this is really cool. The authenticity of Mad River bypassed the, the, the trends that dominate the industry today. Basically maintaining the integrity of the sport that was, the quiet sense of accomplishment and adventure that it used to have. We're different, more individualized here. A single chair and not a corporation. The experience is so much better than it is at these other mega places. The strategy for us in regard to these big passes needs to be to double down on our uniqueness and our quality because more and more people appreciate it. And we all try to work together to make, to produce this thing called Mad River Glen. And I like being a part of something special. The mission statement of the co-op is to protect and preserve not just the ski experience, but the ecosystem of General Stark Mountain. In order to protect the place, people need to understand it. Not only was it an educational opportunity, but it was a new recreational opportunity. So we kicked off uh, the naturalist program here. Almost 30 years later, I'm still doing the tours. Hey, if the lifts can't spin, we still can go hiking. But I want to know that this is here for our future kids. We need to focus on global warming and the climate changing. Everybody's really cognizant of the changes that are happening and working really hard to be nimble and be ahead of the changes to keep us skiing. Everybody cares so deeply about you know, what Mad River is. It's like a big oak tree. I think it has amazing roots and incredibly strong. And I think all the other external factors like weather and, and pandemics and staffing issues and anything you want to throw at us, but we'll still be standing. Who knows what's gonna happen? Any day that we're running this chair, absolute blessing. 
Mount River is an amazing place. 75 years here and looking to continue this well on into the future. It's almost exactly the same as when I first got here. This is a skier's mountain. Matter of a glance, ski it if you can. <laughs>